Thank you, Simon, and thank you for our fantastic orchestra over here, my right hand side. <clears throat> Just to reiterate some of the announcements from this morning, uh, this Tuesday there's an outing plan. Uh, be here by 9.30 in the morning for the outing. See uh, Brother Abraham for all details about that. Um, on uh, Friday, we have Kids Club coming back at 4.30 in the afternoon. So please look forward to that one there. Obviously, it won't be on when we have the family camp, but uh, other weeks will be on. This Thursday is the ladies' meeting at 10.30 in the morning. <clears throat> um, next Sunday, my wife and I will be in uh, Albury. They're having their 49th church anniversary. It's a wonderful blessing to be over there and to be with them. And so in our place over here, you get uh, from Lebanon, Michael Kalush, and from that wonderful, wonderful place of Sudan, we're going to have Luau preaching in the evening. So you have two missionaries here preaching next week. What a wonderful blessing that'll be. Okay. Um, please keep in mind that we have uh, congratulations need to be sent to Ellie and uh, Alison Haddad and the birth of little first, their firstborn baby, David Nabil Haddad. And the good news, for those who know, who knows Abed and uh, his wife Nivat? Put your hand up if you know him. Okay, she's expecting. You didn't know, did you? She's expecting, okay? Wonderful. First, first time they're there, little baby coming. And uh, straight away, first signs of that, what do they call that when mums have a little bit of a problem the first time? What do they call that? What's that word? Morning sickness. Morning sickness. Beautiful, beautiful. She's going through it. Think, oh well, get used to parenting. It's starting now. Even before the baby's born, it's starting now. So praise, praise God for them. All right, tonight we're going to turn to uh, James chapter 4. Sorry, chapter 5, verse 4. Then we'll move on to Deuteronomy chapter 24 for a few verses. So actually, verses 1 to 4, James chapter 5, they get the context in. And then we'll go to Deuteronomy 24, verse 14 and 15. Thank you for those who are visiting tonight. We do have a dinner after service, and everyone here is invited to it, so please don't, don't go home. Stick around, enjoy the fellowship and the food. All right, James chapter 5, verse 1 to 4. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the labourers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. And get turned now to Deuteronomy 24, verse 14 and 15. This is the, the uh, principle in the Old Testament from which verse 4 is taken from. Thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy, whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in the land wherein thou, within, within thy gates. At his day thou shalt give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and setteth his heart upon it, lest he cry unto thee, unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. Let's please bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening and the joy we have of coming together and hear your word. For all the people here, Father, that have taken time to be here in our midst, bless this time together, for it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. This is the third message in Money Matters on preaching. And today we're looking at God's way to make a living. Okay, very simple. How does God tell us we should make a living? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, back over there for a moment, there's an introduction. We told uh, John, uh, God is giving Israel some instructions about when they go to the promised land. And verse 3 and 4, he says that God says, He humbled thee, that's the Jews, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither thy father, the, the fathers knew, that he might make thee to know something very, very important, a principle for how to make a living. Man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. We live by guidance that God gives to us in every area of life, in morals, in wisdom, in, in working, for fine, working for living, every area we follow God. So man doth not live by his own abilities, but by God's word and God's direction. All right, then we're told also 
in, um, uh, in verse uh, 4, and um, it says, Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. In forty years, they never got very, very much income. Well, they got nothing. But in lieu of no income, nothing wore out. There were no expenses. So sometimes we find out that in following God, there is no massive income we planned, but there's no expenses. Now, if you get rid of the expenses, you don't need so much income. Because income is there to take care of expenses. So God says, sometimes he gives you plenty, sometimes he holds back. And we're told in later on in verse 11 to 14, God says, when you go into your land and you have your lands and your, your, your houses and you've got your, your vineyards and your olive yards and everything and God multiplied all your gold and all your silver and all your cattle, hold it, lest you turn from me and go serve idols. He says, watch it. Because sometimes when God gives us plenty, we tend to forget God. He's saying, listen, when you have little, I'll make sure to take care of your expenses. When you have much, make sure you don't stray from me. Because here's the principle in verse 18. Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. God gives us the power to get wealth. That's very, very, very important. It's not up to us to think, I must make a living. It's my job, my responsibility, no one's going to take it from me. It's mine. Hold it. If you're a servant, your job is to follow and do what you're told not to go and take charge of your own life. And everyone who's created by God, that's everyone here today, we are all indebted to God for our living and he's the one who's going to guide and direct us if we listen to him. So instead of making our own way in life, stop and think, now hold on, what way does God want me to take in life? Because my way, lust the flesh, lust the eyes, pride of life, that that satisfies my sinful nature, that's my way. God's way is better. And God said, listen, when it comes to making a living, you follow my way, not your own sinful ways. Trust him, trust in his word, and he will guide us and direct us. In this passage today, because of the fact that sin came in this world, people think it's their job to take care of their physical life and make all their plans themselves. It is their responsibility. And because there's so much sin around and this world doesn't produce like it's supposed to, they have to cheat a bit to get by a little bit of lying here, a little bit of stealing over there. You know, big deal, that's all right. There's no problem. Being a bit selfish over here, not helping someone else over there, that's okay. Have a blind eye to someone else's need and always be wanting more yourself. Well, that's normal, that's normal. For the person who does not know God. But for someone who knows God, we find there's three things God requires of us to make a living. One is not very, very good news to many people. It's called hard work. Does that send a chill up your spine? That hurt? This is a hard work. Second one, honest work. You mean just me? No one else? Everyone else steals. I can be honest? Honest work. And the third one, trust God while working hard and working honestly. Just three simple points. First thing over here, with hard work. In our passage over here, we find you have these people in a rural community and they've got their farms and these great big farmers, obviously they can't farm their own land by themselves, they need to hire people. When you have hundreds and maybe thousands of acres of grain and you've got hundreds, maybe thousands of, of uh, sheep or, or camels or asses, you need someone to take care of them. So they hire labourers. These labourers are poor people and they work on a day-to-day -day basis. They didn't pay them once a week, they paid them once a day because the money they got that day paid for their food that day. And next day, the money they got paid for their food the next day. So they're living on a day-to-day -day basis because they're poor people. And they would go and, and beg maybe or they go and glean for, for their food. So it's very important that the rich people considered the labourers that are working for them need to be paid on a daily basis. In our passage, the rich weren't doing it. These poor don't have a legal leg to stand on. No court's going to support them because they can't uh, bribe judges and stuff like that. So they had a voice that wasn't heard. So the rich would take advantage of them and just would not give them their day-to-day -day food. They have to go out and glean in fields, go to orchards and glean off orchards to try and make a living because they weren't getting paid. And they were told here that the cry of these people and of the man not paid was heard by God in heaven. The Lord of Sabaoth, the God of all the hosts of heaven heard that. Think, boy, watch out. 
So if you're a person who defrauds somebody else, doesn't matter who it is, might even be the government, God hears that. And God will definitely, definitely, definitely be compensated. In this passage, we look at three things. Hard work, honest work, and uh, trusting God while we work. Now, we find over here, work is something that has to be done. And it's not easy because we're lazy people by nature. We're simple people by nature. In the Bible, we find the, the labourers in the parable of vineyard, they work from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Not an eight-hour day, a seven-hour day, six-hour day, a 12-hour day. While the sun was out, they were out. And they would work for a minimum amount of a day, a day wage. Now the poor would work each day, get paid daily, and that was what they had. It was hard work. Now for the landowners, it wasn't easy either. They'd be out in the fields with them, supervising, managing, making sure everything got done properly. They wouldn't be sitting back watching TV. There's no TV. They'd be out there, conscious of what's going on, because they know people sometimes steal. People are lazy. There are people who are thieves are trying to come on through. There are different problems with enemies round about. They'd be there watching all the time. So they'd be working as well as the labourers, not so much sweating, but on the job all the time. That was normal because a lot of things have to be done upon a farm. In, today, day, in today's time, we have people working for wages, some bare minimum, and some, hmm, very, very nice. They come in their own salary, fine, but they all got to work. And sometimes those who are getting a lot of money, they stress out more than the guy who goes to work, does it a few hours, come back home again, that's all he does. Forgets about his work and goes home. Whereas the other guy comes home and, oh, 24-7 is worried, worried, stressed, 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 stressed. No matter how much money you get, hard work is how you get it. Don't ever think of shortcuts. You find those who give you opportunities for shortcuts, there's nothing short of gambling. That's all it is. A shortcut is a pathway to gambling. You have those who are business owners, and they take risks, financial risks, for the hope of profit. And they might uh, put their house up for mortgage, do a lot, do a lot of different things, and uh, get themselves uh, uh, in debt up to the neck or something. The hope of making a profit. And when things don't go well, they're working harder and harder and harder and harder, longer hours, longer hours, longer hours. Why? Well, I want to make a profit. But they're business owners. Aren't they filthy rich? Don't they sit down and do nothing? Nope. Nope. Doesn't matter who the person is, something called hard work characterises employment. People don't get by without that. And you might those have those people who are absolutely rolling in it. I mean, just rolling in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Don't you think they have sleepless nights wondering who's trying to rip me off next? What's happening over here? What's happening over there? What's the, don't you think they're concerned? These people don't sleep nights. If they get three or four hours a night, that's plenty. Why? There's so much concern in their mind. Physical labour, no. Mental, oh baby. So you find you don't escape this thing called hard work. You try and find a shortcut, you get in trouble. There's those who are investors, invest in the stock markets or in casinos, whatever it may be, trying to get their get-rich-quick motives. They have their problems. Ups and downs, they have their problems. So we find over here, Hard work is something that's characteristic of human beings. Because since God cursed this earth and held back its full potential, we have to work harder to produce. Now, when it comes to the land, we understand that. You plant a seed and you get weeds out of it. And the, the, the thing doesn't grow without water. You have the water to irrigate the whole thing. And then you have to take care of it, protect it and feed it all the time. Then it comes the harvest and all the rest of the stuff. That's a year by year by year thing. It's not easy. And if a person's working for an income, same thing. He's working, working, working. Prices go up, what happens to his money? Stays the same. So I don't have the purchasing power. So you find hard work is normal. Don't ever look for a shortcut. But it'll never be appealing to sinful man. Today we find a move towards shorter working hours, more comfortable working conditions, light duty, higher, more, more sick days, you know, that I can take off when I feel like taking a sickie, increased holidays, now, what are they concerned about? Not concerned about productivity. They're concerned about less effort on my part. That's the world today. It's not productivity, less effort. It's a strange. When I was in working in a company, people would come, clock in and clock out, and figure because I clocked in and clocked out, I deserve to get paid. But they did nothing that day. 
they spend an hour in the bathroom. They go and talk over to different guys over here, different things. If a guy worked, or if a guy was in the company for, six, for eight hours, if he worked six out of eight, they're doing good. I did business management for four years. And we discussed over there employment and how to motivate employees to do their job. And they said maximum is six out of eight hours is all you're going to get out of them. Those other two hours, gone. They're gone. Well, that's fine. Unsafe people. Now, God said, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Genesis 3.19. Because of the curse in this world. Now, as a saved person, if you know God, you can hold on. Work is a good thing. In the Garden of Eden, before there was sin, God gave Adam and Eve a job. Go and tend the garden, care for the garden. Now, there's no one else giving him a hand. There's no laborers anywhere. Just him on his own. Go and tend all the garden. How long? It would have been acres. One guy. That would have been hard work. But that's okay. There's no sin around. And work is beneficial. We have people today going to gyms and becoming very, very unhealthy. You know why? No activity. Your work should be activity. You all, you all you guys know about uh, Bruce Lee, the uh, martial arts ex, ex, uh, professional, way, way back when he first started being on TV, that really moved martial arts into the big screen. That guy over there, I read about him, it said, in his normal day, no matter what he was doing, he'd be squashing a ball. He'd be bending over, doing stretches. In his normal day, when he's walking, he'd take bigger steps, throw his, throw his legs up, this type of stuff. In other words, he'd be doing movements right throughout his whole day. In his work, at his normal work, he'd be stretching himself. So basically, his work was a form of exercise. Then he'd go to the gym for other things. But see, your normal working day is good for you. My dad used to work in, the, in, the, uh, in Lebanon. There was no transportation for him. He'd walk an hour up a mountain to his job and an hour down the mountain when his job was over each day. Walking up the mountain, down the mountain. No joggers back then, just ordinary leather shoes. Every day up, every day down again. Now, that kept him fit like anything. Now, he was a stonemason working with great big blocks of stone that tire you. Still, up a mountain, down a mountain, every day, every day, every day. That was normal. No one complained. Why? It's required. Today, oh, if someone doesn't drive me in a cab, forget it. Activity makes you healthy, keeps your whole body going well. It gives you a purpose to wake up each day. If you've got a job to do, and you've got a positive outlook, I want to do it. Why? Because I want to do it better each time, better each time, better each time. I, when I was in Bible college, the part-time jobs you got in Bible college wasn't really uh, admirable. It was being on a garbage run, running behind a garbage truck. The smell wasn't the best, but that was the only job available. And so you go on this job over there, and you're picking about three or four tonnes of rubbish each time. There's no wheelie bins. You've got to pick the bin up, chuck it in. And beach each person about three or four tonnes apiece. And um, you're running for about five, six hours. When you first start, you feel like dying. You pray to die. Lord, let the sky fall in on me because you're so, so tired by it. But after three or four months, fitness comes in and you start to time yourself. Not bad. And some of the guys, we sat down there and we timed ourselves. And there's one time, said, fellas, we're going to breathe our record. I got out of bed early, drove up there early, got a bag, filled up a whole bunch of bins, put them on the side of the road. So when we, when we were going to drive the truck down, we'd miss three or four streets. And then as we were going down over there, we beat our time. When we finished, it was still dark. So, hey, fellas, it's still dark. Wow, success. Now, that was fantastic because we had a goal to beat our time. Now you think, that's a garbage one. Yeah, but it was fantastic. It was exercise. I'd go home and have half a kilo of meat for breakfast and wouldn't even feel it. No matter what job you got, if you've got a positive outlook, you'll love it. You'll love it. And so God gives us work to make us feel better and stronger with a positive attitude. Don't shy from work. It's very, very good. I'll tell you something, having a good work ethic is so, so important. <clears throat> then God says also, <clears throat> with hard work necessity, to think about this, you're not a machine. One day rest. One day rest. In the Bible, it was a Sabbath day, Saturday, they worked six, they rest one. No matter who it was, the wealthy or the poor, the servants or the masters, the workers or the animals, they'd rest one day a week. <clears throat> Very important. Rest, rejuvenate, get strengthened, then get out there for another six days. Then go rest yourself, rejuvenate, be strengthened, go work for another six days. That was healthy living. 
absolutely, and that was the God designed living. <clears throat> the Bible says, wealth is increased by labor. Proverbs 13, 11, wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Proverbs 14, 23, in all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tenth the penury. Guy who works hard, profit. Guy who talks about working hard, <laughs> he'll be poor. In uh, Ecclesiastes 9.10, Whatsoever thy hand find to do, do it with thy might. When you're working for minimal wages or you're getting a phenomenal payback, do your utmost. Because the Bible says when you're working, you're working primarily for God, not for that person who's going to pay you. Then we have also in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, Paul says very, very boldly, If any would not work, neither should he eat. Very simple. You don't want to work? Don't eat. No problems. That's to solve the problem easily. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, verse 32 to 35. Paul went around as a missionary. And as he went around to a missionary, he had some churches, churches supporting him. Wonderful. So he'd be able to work with the money that they had given to him. And sometimes he had nothing. So he went back to his profession of tent making. Today he'd be like carpentry. And he went and worked the daytime and supported himself and his associate ministers with him. He had no worries. In uh, Acts chapter 20, there we two, verse 32 to 35. <clears throat> and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that are with me. For I have showed you in all things how that so labouring you ought to support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, is more blessed to give than receive. He worked night, he worked daytime, he worked part-time, he worked full-time as he had to. And he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, God is not short of a buck. But there were times God says, Paul, you need to go to work. God had plenty of money. Times, you go to work. Times, I'll support you. No problem. Either way, I'm taking care of you financially. So if you want to think about working for a living, your whole goal is this, follow God and work hard. Don't look for a job that is easy. The best job is one that has a challenge. And when I won the garbage run, it nearly killed me the first couple of weeks. I mean, my, everything ached completely, puffed out of air. Everything in my body would kind of hurt like anything. After a few months, I feel as strong as can be. Tarzan, look out, here I come. And I was picking those bins up and dicing them in. There was one time, we we're going towards, um, I think it was a public holiday, we're going to do a double run, 10 hours. I said, I want to do it. I want to do 10 hours. I didn't drive the truck at all, I ran all the time. I was dead at the finish, but I thought, so good. Why? It was a challenge, an absolute challenge. And when you see your work as a challenge, you will love it. Honestly, it's not laborious. Now, there's hard work, then comes honest work. I'll give you the secret of honest work. You ready? Work to please God, not to get wealth. Honest work. Work to please God, not to get wealth. If you're working to please God, you won't lie, you won't cheat, you won't be dishonest. Why? I'm doing this for God. If you're working for yourself, ah, different. I might take shortcuts here and there. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. Labour not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. And then chapter 28. Verse 20 and 22. A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that, hasteth, he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. 22. He that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. In other words, if a person's guided by riches, he'll take shortcuts, he'll cut the corners, he'll sin, but he won't win by it. So if you want to have honest work, the secret is this. Tell yourself, I'm working for God. I'm God's servant. I'm employed by him. He's the one who's guided me. He gave me this job. I'll do my best for him. Finished. 
If I'm working for God, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to lie. Why? He says, for God. He doesn't need lying and cheating for me to do his job for him. No way in the world. I'll be honest. When you have people who start their businesses, they can do all these side little deals for cash here and there and not put it down for tax. Fine, they can do all that and no one will find out. And it's, it's public knowledge today. It's public knowledge. People with businesses or those who are working for themselves get cash deals all the time. Don't tell the government. And the government knows about it. No one's doing anything. And so they think, well, we'll do it. No worries. That's because you're working for you, not for God. If you're working for God, excuse me, I want an invoice, thank you. I want an invoice. I have to charge you more. Give me the invoice. Here's the invoice. Thank you very much. Take your money. See you later. Why? Because God has got the money. He can take care of all the, all the bills. There's no worry about that whatsoever. Labourers on farms were under constant supervision for what they did, not for the time they put in. If someone worked that went to a farm and sat down for eight hours, you got nothing, even though he's there for eight hours. You paid for what you did, which is honest work. Where you, for those people who went and gleaned crops, what they gleaned is what they went home with. If they didn't glean, they got nothing for it. So you find the wealthy labourers, uh, sorry, the, the wealthy landowners, they would withhold their wages on these poor people over here and they'd keep back by fraud, thinking, well, they have no uh, legal right to, uh, to complain from me, so we'll just keep it. It was called legal stealing. Now, today, legal stealing is characterised by, in the Bible, we have a guy called Laban. He changed Jacob's wages ten times. Nabal didn't want to pay David for the security service he gave him. You have marketing today on an international level. One thing they do to make a lot of money is they make product and hold it back. To market demand increases, price goes up, then they release it on the market. And that's legal. I'm selling stuff. I didn't force the price, price went up by itself. I'm simply waiting for the best time to sell my stuff. They're doing it all the time. Legal stealing. You know, if people overproduce, they'd rather dump their stuff in the ocean than give it free of charge to keep prices up where it's supposed to be. That's marketing. You find sometimes people, they go and they market certain goods, they have a beautiful image of this thing, looks so fantastic. You think, wow, this is fantastic. They charge a high price. Oh, this is great. And it's made out of cheap materials and slapped together. It won't last long at all. You think, you're a rotten thing. People think, I've been cheated. Sure you have. Sure you have. Why? Because they, they think in your mind, if you see something good, you think, oh, it's expensive, it's great. But it's not. It's not legal stealing today. You find people market elderly. They'll drive by, they'll see some elderly place, and they'll pick some fault in their home. A guy I knew in Wagga Wagga, and some people come by and say, oh, look, mate, you've got a problem with your roof. Uh, 300 bucks and we'll fix it for you. Oh, thank you very much for telling me. I appreciate that. He goes up on his roof half an hour later. 300 bucks, thanks, mate. He drives away. What do you do? Clean out his gutters. But the elderly didn't know anything. They didn't know any different. Oh, this man says he's going to help me clean my roof out because there's a problem over there and I trusted him. Sure, sure. Uh, people around, honestly, when it comes to making money, they, having, they don't care, they're going to do it and it's legal. I said to Guy, $300 for that stuff done. He did it, so what's the problem? You can't take me to court over it. It's all legal. There's a lot of things done around us today. And by the way, it doesn't make any money for the person. When you steal, God creates bills to take up the extra money you got. He takes away your happiness and joy, so you don't enjoy what you've got. Very simple. There's plain dishonesty. I knew a guy a long time ago, and this is where I got saved, and he was a TV repair fella. And he'd go to a certain place, and he'd see a TV, and say, oh, it's, it's, it's not working. He'd say, oh, I'm sorry, this thing is blown. It's, it's not really good. It costs too much to fix. Look, I'll give you $20 for it, and I've got this really good TV. It's been serviced completely, and I'll give you a cheap price on it. I said, oh, thank you very much. You're such a nice man. That's all right, that's all right. He takes the TV away, 20 cent part in it, and brings back a new again. And he sells it to somebody else. And he'd laugh. Ha, 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 ha. He'd laugh. I knew this guy personally. You know, it didn't bother him. I had a situation myself where um, I was going to sell my home down in Goulburn and to the same real estate agent I bought it from. They know how much I paid for it. And after 25 years, it's going to go up, isn't it? Well, this agent said, oh, boy, how much can you get for me? They gave me a price which is half the value of the home. I said, look, that is in land value. I've been to Goulburn. I've seen the prices. The price are twice that. Suddenly she went silent and hung up. Rip-off artist. Rip-off artist. People try to take advantage of those who are ignorant and don't know anything better. Why is that? Well, that's just legal stealing. That's all. When a person 
They buy something and they claim, they claim it's not worth very, very much. And when they get it, they go around and think, oh, you beauty, what a great deal I got. Wow, what a great deal I got. In Proverbs 2014, it is not, it is not, saith the buyer. When he's gone his way, then he boasteth. This is called bargaining. Bargaining. He told the other guy, you've got to buy something. Oh, just rubbish, mate. Then when you buy it, oh, I've got a fantastic deal, fellas. And that's called legal. That's dishonest. <laughs> dishonest, honestly. Dishonesty attracts God's judgment. Uh, Proverbs 11 1 says, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Someone tries to steal, God says, That's an abomination. But someone who's honest, that's God's delight. Because you see, when a person tries to steal, what he's doing, he's following the God of mammon, not the God of creation. That's idolatry. The love of money is root of all evil. That's not honouring to the Lord at all. The Lord of Sabaoth hears the cries of those who steal. Those who owe money to other people, have the money with them, don't pay. That cries out to God for judgement. Withholding money for the, that belongs to somebody else. It was a certain Christian I know, and this certain Christian borrowed or bought some stuff from a certain person and never paid him. Month goes by, never paid him. Two months goes by, never paid him. And the other person told me and complained to me, and they said, look, forget about it. I don't want, don't want money anymore. I don't want the money anymore. And the other person who, who borrowed the money, didn't worry about it. That's it. In other words, he got it. He held back, held back, held back, till, he, till no one wanted the money anymore. That's business practices. Hold back for as long as possible. God is a debt collector from all victims. I would not want him to come and knock on my door chasing a debt. <clears throat> Proverbs 16, 8 says, Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Absolutely. So if you want the best, just tell yourself, I'm working for God. I don't need to steal. I don't need it. If I find money, I'll give it back. If someone, over, if someone undercharges me, I'll pay them the right amount. No problems, no problems. I don't need the money. It's not mine. It belongs to somebody else. Hudson Taylor said he only wanted consecrated money, money that comes from God. Forget about all the rest of it. Don't need it. Third point, you work hard, you work honest, and you work trusting God. We all need to trust God, be it the labourer who's trusting God who gets paid on time, or be it the employer who's trusting God that his farm produces. It's all the same. We all trust God completely. No matter what we do, farmers had bigger problems than labourers because they couldn't manage the weather. They couldn't stop thieves from coming. They couldn't stop diseases from coming. They couldn't stop differences around about happening to enemies of their crops coming. They couldn't stop that. So they had a bigger problem than the, the labourers. They all need to work trusting God. In 1 Chronicles 29, 12, David said of God, both riches and honour come of thee, and thou reignest over all. This is a good principle. Riches and honour come from God. In Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's something God's proven to me in my life so many times over. When I went to seminary, on purpose God took me through the ringers to teach me this lesson. And for five years, when I was in Wagga Wagga, I never had a hundred bucks in the bank in five years. I never had money in my pocket. It went from one to, to pay, to, I never had it. I never had money in my pocket. My wallet was empty, you can steal, there's nothing in it. Because there was five years, that's where God kept us, on purpose to teach the lesson. Trust in him. That's an important lesson I learned, better than seminary I went to. But I'll tell you something, it worked. It worked. Because after five years of having nothing, and God providing all our needs, we realise, well, you trust in God, not in yourself. He gave me jobs I needed. I was never, ever, ever out of work. I never was on the dole, never had to go to Sendling and say, please send me, I've got no money. Never. God took care of us. Absolutely. I had my wife always taking care of the children at home, never go to work. Her, her job was to be a mum at home. And God blessed us mightily. Five kids, no problem whatsoever. Part-time work while I was serving full-time in, in, uh, in uh, church and in Bible college. No problem whatsoever. So I'll tell you something. You trust in God, it works. Now Proverbs 34, 9 and 10. Sorry, Psalm 34, 9 and 10. It's a beautiful passage of trusting God. <clears throat> oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. 
But they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. There's so many promises in the Bible about trusting God. Psalm 23, 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now David, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. He'll take care of me. He'll provide for me. He'll guide me. He'll direct me. He'll meet my needs. He'll protect me. No problem. Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. When you take God's word seriously, it works. I mean, it works. Guaranteed. Philippians 4.19 But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And there's verse after verse after verse after verse that shows that God will take care of those who trust in him. The very first step in trusting in God is to take Christ as your saviour. Very first step. Not the second, third, fourth. First one. You come, you realise you're a sinner, you're in need of God to save you, you can't save yourself. And so you come before him in repentance and you receive Christ as saviour. When you do, you become God's child. Then you come to him and trust him by faith and he guides you and directs you. And God never, ever, ever, ever lets his children go astray or begging bread. Never. David said, I've been young, now I'm old. Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Never. Now, he might have you on little sometimes and have you on much sometimes. You might be sick sometimes, healthy sometimes. Doesn't matter. But in all the time, He'll be there watching over you and caring for you. So very plain, when it comes to making a living, work hard, work honest, and work trusting God. Let's bow for prayer, please. Loving Father, we thank you for your word and for your wisdom you've given to us. Thank you, Father, and we trust your word. You take all the worry out of life. We can enjoy life to the full, enjoy our contentment, our position we're in, not be envious of other people, not to be desiring to be like them, but rather, Lord, being content with what you've given to us. Help us, Lord, to be those people who stay close to you, especially, Lord God, especially seeing that Christ came in this world to die for us on the cross and pay for our sins, that we might be go children of God and go to heaven. Thank you, Lord, for that. Give us the grace, Lord God, until that time comes, that we be faithful to you on planet Earth. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen.